Hello everyone and welcome back to the Seven Wonders of Genshin series. Today, we'll be looking at the mysterious mountain of Dragonspine, and the secrets that it holds. Of course, this video will only be talking about Dragonspine, so if you want to hear about the rest of Mondstadt, I already have a separate video out for that. Also, if you like this video, consider subscribing. It helps me out a lot and I'd really appreciate it. With that said, let's jump right in. To start off, I'd like to talk about the ancient civilization that inhabited this mountain long before it was called Dragonspine. Before the fall of Durin, this mountain was called Vindagnir, and was once home to the people of Salvendagnir. In the time of this civilization, Dragonspine was not the cold and unforgiving mountain that it is today. Instead, it was a peaceful place, full of beautiful plants and green as far as the eye could see. It was a temperate safe haven from the rest of Mondstadt, which at this time was actually covered with blizzards. These were likely caused by the powers of the kings of ice and frost, those being Decarabian and Andreas. Anyways, this prosperous mountain is where the civilization of Salvandagnir flourished. Not only were they blessed with good harvests and a forgiving climate, but the mountain was also home to an Ermansul tree. This tree was the original frost-bearing tree, and helped the people of Salvandagnir to communicate with Celestia. However, the prosperity of the civilization would not last. In order to heal the broken world and in fear of the rising tide of delusion and breakthroughs, the Primordial Ones sent down the Divine Nails. One of these nails landed on the peak of Dragonspine, turning it into the frozen wasteland we know today. Shortly after this, Salvandagnir would fall. Many of the important figures, including the priest, the princess, and the scribe, would die soon after the Skyfrost Nail's dissension. There was someone named Imunlaker who lived, and he would become disillusioned with Celestia after witnessing the results of what they did. He would then leave the mountain, heading to a land that he may paint red with blood. Later on, some of his descendants would live in Mondstadt, as the Imunlauker clan was one of the founding clans of Barbados' Mondstadt. As for Salvin Dagnir, some of its ruins still stand on Dragonspine, known by many as the Entombed City. As I just mentioned, the destruction of Salvin Dagnir was caused by the dissension of the Skyfrost Nail onto the peak of Dragonspine. When this happened, the mountain was plagued with storms and blizzards. Imunlauker, who was living here at the time, left to try and find a method to stop the blizzards. Meanwhile, the priest Farouk ascended the mountain to try and communicate with Celestia once more, and told his daughter, the princess, to continue her work on her frescoes. However, the priest would die at some point on his journey, and the princess's frescoes would be left unfinished due to her death as well. At some point before the princess died, however, the Skyfrost Nail mysteriously split into three pieces. One of these fragments flew down to Stargo Cavern, and the second flew into an underground chamber on the west side of the mountain. As for the final fragment, it descended upon the Ermansul tree that grew on the mountain, destroying it. These fragments would remain in these spots for thousands of years, frozen in ancient rhyme. However, when the Traveler arrived on the mountain during the In the Mountains world quest, they would unfreeze the fragments using Scarlet Quartz, which would send them back up to the top of the mountain. The Traveler would then ascend the mountain and completely restore the Skyfrost Nail, which would then rise and begin to hover over the mountain. Throughout the mission of restoring the Nail, some of the severe snowstorms on the mountain would subside, making it less dangerous. Still, the Divine Nails are quite mysterious, and the full extent of their capabilities are unknown. Anyways, I'd now like to talk about the mural room located within the ancient palace of the Entombed City. This room contains murals, or frescoes, which were painted by the princess of Salvandagnir. These murals portray the mountain in its prosperous era, back before the Skyfrost Nail fell. The first mural shows a winged figure that is wearing a crown and has a golden glow around their head. This could be an angel or envoy from Celestia, or perhaps even the Primordial One themselves. 
Whoever they are, they are shown holding a golden energy of sorts towards two humans that are also wearing crowns. These two humans may be some of the priests of Sal Vindognir. Next to them, the green mountain of Vindognir is depicted with Celestia moored above it. There is also a priest on the right side of the mural, with what look like people carrying objects to the peak of the mountain in front of him. As for the second mural, it once again shows the mountain of Vindognir, this time with a mighty palace built on top of it. Above the palace is a golden orb hanging in the sky, possibly representing some sort of divine figure. There are also winds that are blowing towards Vindognir from the other mountains surrounding it, likely representing the snowy land that Mondstadt was at the time. Now, the princess had a few interesting abilities, mainly due to the fact that she was born under the Ermensul tree within Salvindognir. One of these abilities allowed her to have visions of the future. When the Skyfrost Nail fell, her father told her that if her next mirror was of thawing snow along with blue sky and green grass, everything would be okay. However, this mural was not completed, as the princess could not remember what blue sky and green grass looked like, and she would also die around this time. When Emil Nauker returned to Salvendognir to find everyone dead, he left his greatsword, the Snow Tomb Star Silver, in the mural room. It had been gifted to him by the princess, so it is likely he left it here so he would not use it for his journey of blood. The mural room would later be sealed, likely by the scribe Uko. Thousands of years later, the Traveler would unseal the room and would also recover the Snow Tomb Star Silver. Now then, I'd like to talk about a beautiful place that lies within the mountain of Dragonspine. Starglow Cavern spans the depths of Dragonspine and is full of majestic ice crystals and dangerous paths. There is also some peculiar vegetation that grows here that helps illuminate the area. The cavern goes down quite a little bit, and contains a few hidden secrets and puzzles. At the bottom of the cavern was also where one of the fragments of the Skyfrost Nail went. Like the other fragments, it flies back to the top of the mountain after being unfrozen from the ancient rhyme that it was sealed in. Back in the time of the fall of Salvandognir, the scribe Uko came here to make some ancient carvings. Interacting with all of these carvings around Dragonspine will unlock the mural room that I just talked about. Getting back to Uko though, just before he entered the cavern, he buried the princess outside of one of the entrances. I'll talk more about the princess in the last section, but for now, I want to finish the story of Uko. He was one of the last survivors of Salvandognir, as almost everyone else had died in the disaster. His ultimate fate is unknown, but there is a Frostom Laurel on Dragonspine that shares his name, so it is possible that they could be the same. Anyways, the area of Starglow Cavern and the stories it holds are quite impressive. It is a huge, hollow area beneath Dragonspine, yet despite this emptiness, the beautiful mountain still stands tall. Now, for this next wonder, I actually want to talk about a certain animal that lives on the mountain. This would be none other than the Great Snowboard King. On the east side of Dragonspine, you may find a cliffside area that houses three snowboards that have been frozen in ice. If you melt the ice and then kill the snowboards, the Great Snowboard King will appear and challenge you to a fight. This is part of the Ah Fresh Meat world quest, in which you are tasked by Harris to obtain some pieces of chilled meat. This quest also allows you to make goulash, which is quite useful for exploring Dragonspine. Anyways, the Great Snowboard King can be fought every 12 hours and drops a great amount of chilled meat. It also has the title of the True Ruler of Dragonspine, which is likely just a fun detail and not important to the overall lore. Getting back to the fight though, at some points the Great Snowboard King can enter a Berserker state. When this happens, it will stomp around causing snowballs to fall from above that deal cryo damage. These are snowballs that fall from the mountain, and the Great Snowboard King most likely does not wield the power of cryo. Anyways, the Great Snowboard King is an interesting part of Dragonspine, and who knows, we may get more information on it someday. For most of this video, 
I've talked about wonders relating to the civilization of Salvandognir and its fall. However, I'd now like to skip ahead to the Cataclysm and talk about the venomous dragon Durin. Durin was created by the alchemist Gold, also known as Rhindaughter, who was from Conria. During the Cataclysm, Durin flew to Mondstadt, where he fought with the animal Archon Barbados and his dragon companion Dvalin. Barbados and Dvalin were able to defeat Durin, leading him to fall onto the mountain of Vendognir, where his skeleton still lies. After his fall, the mountain was renamed Dragonspine. Now, some of you might think that Durin was an evil dragon, who just wanted to cause destruction. However, the truth was quite the opposite. Durin came to Mondstadt hoping to tell everyone about the beauty of his homeland. When he got there, he saw the beautiful green fields and blue skies. He heard people singing down below, and danced in the sky with Barbados and Dvalin. However, all of this was a lie. It wasn't until Dvalin landed the killing blow that Durin saw what was really happening. People were screaming, Barbados and Dvalin were trying to stop his attacks, and the sky and land were painted crimson red. Despite all of this though, Durin held no ill will towards the ones who killed him. He knew he would die amidst the snow, but thought that it would be for the best. In his last moments, he said goodbye to his mother, Rhindaughter. He also said farewell to Barbados and Dvalin, sincerely hoping that they could have met at a different time to sing and dance together. After his death, his blood was spread across the land, creating crimson agate and likely scarlet quartz as well. The blood also helped in reviving the frost-bearing tree, which had been dead for a long, long time. As for his heart, it lies deep in the core of Wormrust Valley, still beating to this day. Now, for the last wonder of this video, I'd like to talk about the frost-bearing tree. Thousands of years ago, the original frost-bearing tree grew on the mountain, and was worshipped by the people. It was a beautiful Erminsul tree, and it helped the people of Salvandognir to communicate with Celestia. However, when the sky frost nail fell and later split into three pieces, the tree would be destroyed. Upon seeing this, the princess would attempt to revive it. She took a branch from the tree and made her way to an island to graft it to another tree. However, her attempt was unsuccessful, and she would end up dying on the island. Eventually, Uko would find her body and later bury it outside a Starglow cavern. Thousands of years later, when the venomous dragon Durin fell onto the mountain, the tree would be revived. His blood seeped into the land and would eventually meet the roots of the Erminsul tree. 500 years later, the traveler would unseal the fragment of the Skyfrost nail that had fallen where the Erminsul tree once stood. After the fragment flew up to the top of the mountain, the Erminsul tree regrew as the frost-bearing tree. Instead of the usual blue veins of Erminsul, however, the frost-bearing tree has red veins due to Durin's blood. You can offer a total of 110 crimson agate to the tree in exchange for various rewards. 80 of these crimson agate can be found in the open world, with the others being obtained from Crimson Wish twice a week. One of these rewards is the catalyst known as Frostbearer, which is described as a fruit born from the coalescence of the tree's might that the travelers should take with them as they enact justice. And those are seven of Dragonspine's wonders. Dragonspine is quite a bit smaller than the other areas I've covered in this series, but it was still a very fun video to make. As I said at the beginning of this video, I do already have a video on the Seven Wonders of Mondstadt if you'd like to check that out as well. If you'd like to know more about the history of Dragonspine, I also have a video that talks about the stories in the Blizzard Strayer artifacts, as well as one that goes over the story of the killer Eberhardt. As for this series, I'll be doing episodes by expansion, so there will be videos about the Chasm, Inazuma's other islands, and Sumeru's deserts in the future. I'd love to hear what wonders throughout other areas and nations you'd like to hear me go over in this series in the comments below as well. Anyways, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Sources and further readings are also in the description if you want to check them out. I hope you all have an amazing day, and I'll see you all in the next video.